Before we get into this video, I would like to thank my patrons, Harpy, Corporal Hot Pockets, and Salvatore Di Pietro. The three of you make this channel possible, and you guys are awesome. Hey all, welcome back to the channel. In the last video in this series, we talked about the state of the galaxy in the 41st and early 42nd millennium, the Imperium and Chaos. We also briefly looked at the warp, and today we're going to expand on that. Really just taking a general look at what the Immaterium is, how it works, and why it's just so weird and hellish. But real quick, if you would consider liking, subscribing, and hitting the bell icon, it would help the channel a lot. Really, all you have to do is just drop a comment down below, any form of interaction helps. But of course, viewing this video is more than enough for me. If you want to talk to me personally, I do have a Discord, and there's also a Patreon where you can DM me. Patrons get to DM me, that's fun. And of course, Instagram and Twitter exist too. Shameless self-advertising aside, let's get into it. In truth, when it comes to the Warp, also known as the Immaterium, also known as the Realm of Chaos, also known as the Aether, also known as the Empyrean, also known as the Sea of Souls, <gasps> there are two things that you need to know. Well, three things, really. It enables interstellar travel for folks such as the Imperium of Man. It is chaotic <laughs> and turbulent, with a ton of dangers that may want to eat you, burn you, corrupt you, or just simply disassemble you into your base particulates. After all, it is the home of chaos and their respective forces. And all psychic powers come from the warp as it is driven by the actions, thoughts, and more of all sentient life out there. These are simple points, and for those just getting into 40k, it is a godsend because it is extremely hard to get a straight answer. However, even with these in mind, the grim darkness that is the warp will never truly be understood. It is different. It behaves differently at a fundamental level from our universe, and we feeble mortals can only observe its effects, not necessarily its inner workings. We can theorize, but then we have to ask what would drive the theories, and therefore we'd have to make a theory to support the theory which is hypothetically supposed to explain the nonsensical, non-embodied, non-reality that is the Immaterium. It's just nuts. But why is it nuts? Well, it's because our actions and thoughts and emotions affect the warp. But why does that happen? I couldn't tell you anything with certainty other than it just does. That said, it's good to understand how we interact with the warp, notwithstanding why. So without getting into the mechanics of the warp, we just need to understand this. Imagine for a moment that the warp is a cauldron of water. The water's calm, the water doesn't do anything because there's nothing influencing it. So now take a small tiny cube of dry ice and say that this cube represents the thoughts and actions of Steve the Orc. He's a simple guy really, but he thinks he's really, really strong. Strong enough to take on a space marine. Well, drop that into the cauldron and some tiny bubbles might show up, but it is overall insignificant to the water. Well, the thing about orcs is that there are a lot of them. Steve has friends. Many, many, many friends. And they have friends. And all of them are saying that Steve is super strong and can tackle a space marine. So now take all those cubes of dry ice and drop it into the cauldron. Now we see an actual disturbance in the water. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Let's say Steve does something to show off how strong he is to his orc buddies. Good job, Steve. Well, now all of the orcs are sure Steve is just that guy. So take their gossip and thoughts and double the size of the dry ice cubes. Now the cauldron is bubbling, fogging, steaming, and rippling. As a result, it might spill out a little. It might have an effect on the floor. Suddenly, Steve actually is that strong because all the other orcs genuinely believe Steve is just that guy. That is warp mechanics 101, people. Now, why does the warp do that? Why does it react to Steve? It just does. It doesn't make sense. It just sees. Steve thinks he's great. The three million other orcs thinks he's great. He just must be that good. How about something more human? Take the Sisters of Battle. There was a case in which a squad of Battle Sisters lost one of their own in the heat of combat. Their fallen comrade received a mortal wound right to their neck. What did the Sisters do? They prayed. They prayed to the Emperor for deliverance and for the healing of their sister. Then, suddenly after a miracle, the dead woman came back to life. What happened? Did the Emperor see them in act? Maybe, but probably not. 
What most likely occurred is they just interacted with the warp unknowingly. Even though they are not as numerous as the orcs, their faith and certainty in the Emperor and their sheer uncompromising willpower caused a reaction in the Empyrean, which brought their sister back. But this is interaction with the warp at a very localized level. What is an example of a galaxy-spanning society either directly or indirectly causing a tremendous change in the warp? Well, remember when I mentioned the Eldar in the last video? Look, simply put, they fucked up. Now imagine for a moment that you're not immortal, but you're pretty much there. You've just lived for so long and done so much that life's gotten kinda stale. Well, not to worry, just do something new. But you already did everything there is to do. Ah, just do one of those things you already did, but get creative with it. And then that gets boring. So you switch it up for some other things, and then you run out of things to do. So you get even more creative with it all. You just go farther and farther and farther, and then you lose it. You break because it just becomes an obsession. Well, now imagine that the vast majority of people in your nation are in the exact same boat as you, and you see where I'm going with this. The Eldar became so obsessed with pleasure and went to such excessive means to feel it on such a massive galactic scale that they caused the warp to become turbulent. It was just so widespread, so common, so excessive and wild that the Immaterium began to create something with it. A literal self-aware deity dedicated solely to excess and pleasure. Slanesh. Warp storms, which you can compare to say a hurricane that stops flights and shipping routes in their tracks, formed all across the galaxy. It effectively made interstellar travel for us, humanity, impossible. And that was the nail in the coffin for our civilization at the time. But the Eldar just kept going further. Just that little, tiny, new sensation. And then it was too late. All that chaotic sin coalesced into the Chaos God Slanesh, who laid claim to the Eldar. Their souls, their bodies, their minds, their gods, all of it would go to Slanesh. Now the Eldar are in a terrible place. They are a species few in number, constantly declining a fraction of their former glory, and their ultimate fate is to one day become one of Slanesh's playthings. Fun! For Slanesh. And really, this is a basic way of understanding how we, all the thinking, breathing mortals of the galaxy, can influence and affect the warp. That's right, life's own actions turned what should be an afterlife of purgatory into space hell. Thanks, Katan, old ones, Necrons, and Eldar. You guys really set us up for damnation, literally. That isn't to say humans are saints here. In fact, today, we are the driving force behind chaos. Our backstabbing, scheming ways to amuse Zinj, our perversions and vulnerabilities to corruption tickles Sanesh, our constant wars and angry spilling of blood satisfies Korn, our sick and dying please Nurgle. I should note, however, that the Chaos Gods don't really pay attention to us. They pay attention to their great game, which is their constant competition for dominance in the warp. As much as we like to look at their invading armies and shout, THEY'VE GOT IT OUT FOR US, ah! No, they don't. We are at most a passing interest and at worst an occasional problem that crops up every few thousand years. Not that they understand the concept of time because the warp is timeless. Okay, so to make a long story short, we will never understand the warp. It is other. It is different. It simply is and is not and always will be what it is not not. So to say that I am more or less going to be talking out of my ass for this bit would be an understatement. But hey, it'll be fun. I talked with Installation 00 uh, a few months ago back when I wrote this script about the warp and time. And he pretty much mirrored what I was thinking and encouraged me to make this segment. So you guys ready for headaches? I am. All right, the warp. Timeless, right? So what does that mean? Well, just think about it like this. Count to three. One, two, three. That's time. Uh, you just counted three seconds of time, or rather you counted what you perceived to be three seconds of time. Because the thing is, you observe the universe through a frame of reference. Okay, well, what does that mean? The easiest and arguably one of the more famous examples involves two people, a ball, and a train. If you are on a train moving at 20 kilometers per hour and you have a ball in your hand, from your perspective you are standing still on a train which is moving. You are not moving, you just so happen to be in something that is, but you yourself are standing still. You throw the ball, and it's really just a short toss, nothing hard, not a huge throw. It travels four or five feet, falls, bounces, and rolls away. To you, that ball was slow and pathetic. So. Gonna reiterate, you are standing still on a train which is moving at 20 kilometers per hour. You toss a ball and it's a light toss and that's that. That's it. 
Now, let's say I am watching the train go by, and I'm able to see you throw the ball. Well, from my perspective, you aren't standing still. You and the train are both moving at 20 kilometers per hour, and so is the ball. Though in the ball's case, it is just a tiny bit faster, because the speed you threw the ball at is added on to the train's 20 kilometers per hour. That is a frame of reference when it comes to something like space, and we know that frames of reference for time can change. We can only see the linear progression of time and cannot move freely through it. We can only move forwards through time and we can still observe it. That does not mean that time is universally the same everywhere. Fun fact, GPS satellites have to be specifically adjusted to match the time you and I would experience on the surface of the Earth. This is called the Sagnac effect and it is something you may want to look up. Fascinating stuff. Now, with that said, no matter what, we will see time in a linear fashion. Different events happen before, during, and after one another. I was born the same year as Halo 2 was released, so my favorite fun fact piece of trivia. But I was not born in the same month, therefore I was not born at the same time. Now we gotta look at the warp. Okay, warp is timeless. What does that mean? Well, that means everything happens simultaneously because there is no time. But we have to pause because that just fundamentally makes no sense and conflicts with the lore. Going back to Slaanesh, Slaanesh was created after the other Chaos Gods as a result of the Eldar's crimes and sins. If the warp is timeless, that would make no sense, as Slaanesh cannot be born in the warp at one time when they have always existed and have always been self-aware. Plus, we know that characters and such can perceive time in the warp, and travel times through the warp exists. Clearly, time does exist, but it does not exist in a fashion that you and I would be familiar with. So how do we potentially solve or explain this oddity? Well, the real answer is we don't, but I am willing to try because this is fun, it's a great thought experiment, and contrary to the highly hypocritical set in stone condescension some might be willing to throw at people who generally just want to analyze the warp, this actually fits entirely within the point of it. I will get to that in a second. And also, I'm a nerd, it's fun, and I will gladly tie myself in knots because that is just who I am. Alright nerds, let's do this. We've all heard of Schrodinger's cat at some point in our lives. It's a quantum physics, quantum mechanics thought experiment crafted by Erwin Schrodinger in 1935. Look, long story short, if you think you get it, you don't and that is the point. It is a theoretical way for explaining things and understanding things, but not necessarily understanding the underlying why or how of the things we are theorizing in an exact manner. In the words of Rick Sanchez, it's entirely like a man capable of maintaining a platonic relationship with a physically attractive female co-worker. They're entirely hypothetical. So what does Schrodinger's cat specify? Well, because there are lots of cat lovers out there, I'm gonna switch the cat out for Steve the Orc. Steve is thrown into an airlock by his fellow orcs for stealing the skull of an Umi that, you know, one of his buddies collected. Not cool Steve. The rowdy crowd sets the airlock door to a timer that lasts for an hour and they leave Steve to process his actions before he dies. Very morbid and sentimental for an orc, really. Well, here's the thing about orcs. Their tech is just welded crap. This door doesn't work half the time, so there is a 50-50 chance Steve will survive. The orcs don't come back to check on the airlock for three hours, so for two of those three hours that Steve has remained unobserved, the orcs don't actually know if Steve is alive or dead, so for all intents and purposes, Steve is both alive and dead until someone actually heads over to observe him. While this is actually meant to represent theories and how they are hypothetical until proven, I think this sets up a good understanding for the next part. One thing that is noted is that different individuals experience the passage of time differently in the warp. For one person, a century is just a day, for another, they die of old age. So here's my question. What if everything happens simultaneously in the warp until it is observed? We know from things like the actual double slit experiment that yes, the simple act of observation can change the measured results of an experiment. Fascinating stuff. Now we have to remember that the warp is effectively a boiling cauldron affected by, well, everything and everyone that lives, breathes, and thinks, so how would this apply there? Who knows? So. Here's the thought experiment. Two heretical Astartes are fleeing from the Imperium right after the end of the Horus Heresy, which is an event that we'll get to another day. They flee into the warp where their patron Chaos God happens to protect them. Space Marine A parts ways with Space Marine B, and both are no longer observing the other. They are completely separate and unable to interact with each other. They emerge 10,000 years later during the fall of Cadia in Millennium 41, also something we will get to another time. They went in together, and they went out together. But there was a period of time where they were not observing each other. For Space Marine A, it's only been a decade. For Space Marine B, it's been 4.6 centuries. 
but they only observed the amount of time that passed for the other when they regrouped and observed the other. Their experiences happened simultaneously, but they only grasped the true length of time for the other when they observed the other. I mentioned Zero Zero earlier, and he brought up a good point. If time is simultaneous until observed in the warp, and the warp is effectively a realm of souls and consciousness, it would mean that continuity in the traditional sense would be non-existent or reset, and that the warp's intrinsic properties with the theory above in mind would either prevent temporal paradoxes, or at the very least, would potentially render them moot. Bam! Science, motherfucker! But, well, at the end of the day, it is still confusing. We still wouldn't know the why, even if that theory were true, and I doubt D GW intends to go that deep with the immaterium's mechanics, we would still not understand the why. Why is time simultaneous until observed? Why is continuity broken by this time if time is still observed? Why exactly does it correct paradoxes? We have a system and an idea positing a potential solution to the paradoxes brought about by the warp being timeless, yet we are not any closer to truly understanding the immaterium because we would just be opening more doors to more questions with questions beneath those doors. The warp is simply other and that is that. Okay, uh... Yeah, is your, uh, is your brain okay? You doing okay? You're, uh, you alright? Cool, um, I'm gonna go, um, drink some water. I will see you in the cosmos, friends.